So I think we're ready to paint. This is Nancy at Sipping and Painting Hamden. We are going to paint this beautiful painting called Mystic Mountain. And uh, you, it's kind of hard to see the whole thing over there. I want to be close enough to show you every step. Um, but there are two trees on this side, one tree on this side, and then this beautiful pink mountain um, and a moon. It's going to be a fun one to paint. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take our largest brush. So find your largest flat brush in your, in your brushes. Whatever that, your brushes are gonna look different than mine. Um, I'm using a bigger canvas, bigger brushes. That way you can see what I'm doing a little bit better. But I'm just going to cover my canvas with plain old water. Plain old water, that's all it is. And we're doing this because Denver's a very dry place. And uh, the, the paint will dry really quickly. So I just want to be sure and keep it, keep my uh, canvas hydrated so that the acrylic paints don't dry too quickly. All right. So obviously I'm not being careful. I'm just kind of sloshing it on there rather imperfectly, but that's okay, no problem. And today we're gonna to be using primary colored paints. I did not include yellow in this mix because we don't really need it. We're gonna be using white, red, blue, and black. If you want to add yellow in to make some of your mountain orange, you're absolutely welcome to do that. The original does not have any orange in it, but you're always welcome to fix yours and change yours exactly the way you want. That's always the case here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I wanna, uh, oh, and by the way, uh, we have 500 different paintings here at the studio and I rotate which ones we teach uh, virtually. And so my blue in this kit may not be exactly the same color as that blue. We have about hmm, maybe five or six different colors of blue um, at the studio and we only put one of those colors in the kit. So just so you know, this one will probably be a little more purpley, um, but it will be beautiful with this painting. Uh, just a heads up on that. This particular blue that we're using is called ultramarine, but any blue will work. You can see it's slightly different. Any blue will work. So I'm picking up some blue on my biggest brush and I'm just sweeping it back and forth on my sky to make a pretty blue sky. And it's okay that we have brush strokes going horizontally. In fact, that's exactly what we want because it just looks like the wind has swept across the sky and any little white lines are little thin clouds. Uh, so it's all good. Streaks are good. Streaks are a good thing. So I'm putting lots of blue, lots of blue. And I'm gonna keep going with this blue and then I'm gonna fade it off toward the bottom. Notice how I'm going all the way back and forth across the painting, all the way from one side to another. That way I get these nice, long, smooth strokes. And I can use my brush to paint the sides of the canvas as well as the top of the canvas. When I paint the tops and the sides and the bottoms, the bottom rather, then it's going to, uh, that's called a gallery wrap and it's going to look finished hanging on your wall. I like to tease people and say, you know, then you can take down your high school diploma and your college degree and your wedding picture and your kids' pictures and replace it with your art, right? I'm sure they'll be thrilled. So I'm just gonna take this blue farther down, but as I go farther down, it's going to just get lighter. I'm not gonna be worried about the saturation of it because this is all gonna be behind a mountain. But there is a little bit of blue at the base of the mountain where we don't put pink. So I am gonna just take it down lightly into the mountain area. 
I'm not at all worried about how that looks, not even a little. On this lower part, most of it's gonna be covered by a giant pink and purple mountain. Just absolutely beautiful. All right, now up here, I'm gonna just pick up a little bit of white on the corners of my brush. Look, it looks like little dog ears. And I'm going to just streak in some little white lines just to break up this blue a bit and to suggest that there's some clouds. And I can just sweep them on there. My paint is still pretty wet from the canvas being wet. Uh, so once it dries a little bit, I can go through it again and just really make it smooth. So you'll see that this blue is much more intense than this blue. And that's okay. We painted this sky and this painting with all different colors of blue and they all look amazing. If you wanna add more white, you can. It's totally up to you on the intensity of the blue in the sky that you want. And I'm just streaking that in and those, those streaks just look a little bit like thin clouds just pulled across the sky by the wind. So what I have noticed when people paint here is if someone is a very meticulous person, they have a very neat house, neat desk, or they do a lot of detail work, um, accountants and engineers and people who schedule other people. Uh, people uh, who do are very meticulous by nature, they will often over blend. So I encourage you to, if you're like that, just don't over blend, leave some streaks. We wanna see some blue streaks and some white streaks because it adds some depth to our sky and some visual interest. So don't ever blend, over blend, friends don't let friends over blend. Hmm. By the way, uh, I'm wearing an apron. I hope you have your apron handy. I also have water and I have napkins and I have three sizes of brushes. You may have different brushes than I have and that's okay, that's, that's great. But those are the basics that, that we need for this painting. Yep, I got those. So it's a different, it's a different blue. This is probably a phthalo blue or a cobalt blue. Um, but we have so many different blues here and they all look great with this painting. It's just that um, ultramarine blue is a good go-to blue for our kits because it mixes so well to make purple, um, where some of the other blues don't mix quite as well with some of the reds. So yeah, um, this one works pretty well. And I'm gonna continue to put my hand going to remember to do the sides of my canvas all the way around. And we're going to have to let this dry a few minutes. I left just enough room to turn my painting over to paint the bottom. I didn't put blue all the way down because that area is going to be covered with black paint in a few minutes. A little bit. In a little while, I mean. When I rinse my brushes, I always rinse them a lot um, because acrylic paint dries in about five to 10 minutes and especially here in Denver and it dries on the brushes and ruins them. So 
to keep your brushes in good shape, be sure you clean your, your uh, brushes a lot in the water. Let the water do all the work. And then I just dab them on the napkin to make sure it's clean. And if you use the water to do the work, then you won't use a whole tree of napkins. I've learned that over the years. I'm gonna be sipping with water. I'm not sure if you're sipping with anything. But if you are celebrating anything, cheers to you. <laughs> Thank you, I'm sipping water. Nice. We can toast to still being alive, right? Exactly, you got it. Every day when I drive to work, I see so many homeless people outside. And as terrible as this pandemic is and as frustrated as I am being cooped up all the time, it is, I have a lot to be thankful for. I understand. When I want to paint thin lines with a big brush, uh, well, there's two surfaces on a, on a big flat brush. And a flat brush is basically one that when you turn it on its side, it's flat. The metal has been crimped and that way is broad and that way is flat. If I paint with the broad end of it, I get these great big strokes. But if I paint with the thin end and if I turn it on its side, I get teeny tiny lines. So I really like the big brush, a big flat brush because I can use it to do straight across detail work, which is kind of hard to believe for such a big brush, but it works pretty well for those skinny lines. But if it's, uh, I always tell people, if you're not comfortable, if that doesn't come naturally holding it on its side, then doing it with a small brush also works. I just put the blue down here just for the example of the brush, but it's not necessary. Like I said, it's not necessary to paint down here, but as long as I've got it, I'm just fussing. I wanna make sure I give you enough time to put your background on. Okay. This particular painting has a darker sky on the top, which suggests early evening. Uh, and then it's, it's lighter down here. So if you want to put more dark at the top, feel free. It's really up to you. I notice in Denver, sometimes it could be the middle of the day and I see the moon. And I'm not, I really don't know as, um, astronomy enough to know what times of the year that is, but, uh, it's funniest thing. Sometimes you can see the, the moon and the sun in the same sky. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. But if you want it to look more um, evening, you can darken it up with more blue. Okay.
And I'm noticing that my canvas is starting to dry out a little bit and it's getting tougher to move that paint. My paint is drying and the canvas is pretty thirsty. So if anytime you wanna smooth something, you can always just go into your water and pick up a drop of water. And then I knock it off my jar just so I don't get any drips, but it does make painting a little smoother just to have a moist brush. And I have to try not to be a perfectionist about this. Me too. Sometimes when you put on a, a second coat and the first coat isn't dry, you end up taking paint off more than laying it down. So you do have to let the first coat dry a bit, let it set a bit before you put on the second coat. Okay. And the way you know if your painting is dry, there's a few different ways. The first way is if it's still shiny. And so I can see down here, my painting is pretty matte. It's, uh, it's pretty dry. I can touch it and it doesn't come off on my fingers. It's just not shiny. But when I look at the top, it's still very shiny. So that's the first way to know it's wet, if it's shiny. The okay. second way to know is if you put your hand on the back of the canvas and if it feels cool, cool to the touch, cooler than room temperature. So uh, the third way to know if your painting's wet is if you pick it up and you rub it on someone you live with. And if they <laughs> scream, it was wet. <laughs> but I don't recommend that way. Okay, I don't either. <laughs> You could get in a lot of trouble that way. Yeah. So I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk over to my fan. Um, you can put it in front of a fan or a hair dryer, or you could just wave it around. And that also works. Denver's so dry, it works well. I'm gonna go stick mine in front of a fan for a few minutes, okay? okay. I can see that my painting's a little shiny, still up on the top. Oh, uh-huh. How's yours doing? Um, it's still a tiny bit, yeah. Okay. Right. Well, we can go ahead and lay in the structure of our mountain um, okay. because if it's mostly dry paint, we'll stick to it. Um, if it's very wet, paint won't stick on top of wet paint. But if it's mostly dry, uh, fresh paint will stick on top of it. Sound okay. good? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'm going to, um, it doesn't really matter if you use a medium brush or a small brush, but definitely not a large one. And I'm just going to put white paint on my brush. And I'm just going to lay out where my mountain is. Now this painting the mountain is slightly off center to the left. And the reason for that is that when you're painting a landscape painting, it's always mm -hmm. a good idea to not have things uh, perfectly symmetrical because then they don't look natural. So um, the original artist on this one, who was not me by the way, um, <clears throat> put two trees on this side and one on that side. And then obviously the moon's only on one side but the mountain is slightly to the left. Mm -hmm. And all of that asymmetry is good for um, making, you know, just making it pretty. Um, if it's, if you're painting a landscape or anything natural and you make it too symmetrical, it just doesn't look realistic. It looks fake, kind of like Disney World. It might still be pretty, but there, it just seems off. So having things that are asymmetrical or odd numbers uh, just feel more natural and your eye is more uh, pleasant to look at in general. There's all, you know, 
lots of opinions on that, but that's what I find. So I'm yeah. going to put my peak a little off, off uh, center. So I'm going to just go right about there. It's, here's your bravery test, <laughs> Bob Ross would say. And then I'm just going to keep it wiggly and not too steep. Okay. I'm going to do the same thing to the other side. Keep it wiggly, not too steep. I can always make it bigger, but it's hard to make it smaller without redoing the background. Okay. And then I'm just going to take some paint that's still on my brush and Notice how these streaks are going out down the slope of that, uh, as if I were skiing down, going with the slope. I'm mimicking this slope with the strokes below it. I'm not going to fill everything in because I don't want this to just be a white mountain, obviously. But I am using these strokes to define the slope. Okay. And this line here does not have to be perfectly straight. In fact, it's better if it's not straight. What I mean is the line that ends up happening here. Oh. In other words, they shouldn't meet perfectly in the center, perfectly. Okay. But these can come down on this side. So what the line that it creates should be more like a Harry Potter scar if you read the Harry Potter books or uh, at least know, know that he had a scar on his head. So the line would be like this. Just, oh. just solely from the way we pulled the paint down. And I did all that with my medium brush, but you could use a small if you want. And like I said, I'm leaving some of that blue in the background because I, I don't, there's no need to cover it up. This mountain's going to have blue and pink and white and off white. So if I have blue and white there, I'm already ahead of the game. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to go grab another size brush for myself while you um, get to that point. How's it looking so far? Um, let, let me see. How to switch the camera to take a look at? Can you see it? I don't know if you can see mine.
Oh, there's a picture. Now you can, now how's that look? Okay, I have to step over to the computer to see you, but I did, and it looks great. Oh, okay. Nice job. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pull together a little bit of red and a little bit of white, and I'm gonna make pink. Now again, this pink, it won't be exactly like the pink in the painting. It's just, you know, there, there are different colors of red. The red we use is just a good all-purpose mixing red, and the original painting, who knows what they originally did. We have 500 of them, but we'll be, it'll be close and it'll be pretty. What size? I'm gonna mix what together size? pink. What size brush are you using? I am using a small brush, but it's not the smallest brush I have. Okay, gotcha. Because I want small lines. You'll see in this painting, I'll show you up close. It's very messy. It's just tons and oh. tons of individual lines. I gotcha. But it's okay. messy. It is messy. Okay. And so if you are a neat person, you're gonna have to really fight the urge <laughs> to not blend the colors in. So I'm gonna put some of my pink on in and stripes, but I don't want them to look like perfect stripes. I want them more or less to go with the flow of the mountain. Oh, and okay. then sometimes I'm gonna mix a little more red in to my pink. I'll just pick up a little red on that dirty pink brush and, and let it be a little redder. And I'm gonna squiggle my motion sometimes. So I'm getting a variety of lines. Some are long, some are short, some are jagged, some are red. Okay. And then from the other side, I can mix a little pink that's a much, much lighter pink. That's just barely pink. And I can put some of those in there too. What I don't want to do is I don't want to cover up all of that blue or that background white. I want to leave some of it. Now, if your strokes are too big and you're not liking that, you can switch to a smaller brush. Okay. It just depends on if you like the look of it. You can scribble some of it in. <clears throat> what I'm going to do, since the moon is over here and this side of the painting seems to be brighter, you can see it has more white in it. Uh -huh. So that's telling me that this side is getting more moonlight. Okay. So I'm going to deliberately add more white to this side. And I'm going to deliberately add more blue to this side. Believe it or not, that's really all the pink I need over there. That didn't take long at all. But I can go in with that dirty brush. Doesn't matter because these two work together. And I can make a purple, a little red, and a little blue. And that will give me this eggplant color. And then to make that more lavender, I just need to add some white. But before I do, I'm just gonna play with it a bit and I'm gonna add a few streaks of purple. Okay. Why not? And you can see it in here, there's some little streaks of purple. This side is gonna be my darker side of the mountain. It has a little bit of purple in it. Then I can pick up some white 
not I'm not picking I'm not mixing in all the white with anything because I need to save a little for my moon. But if I add some white to that dark lavender, I mean uh, eggplant, then it becomes lavender. And that's another color I can stripe in there. And I can, you know, I can let these colors overlap a bit. They don't have to be perfect. They don't have to be all lined up. Okay. Like soldiers, like, they just mix and play. And maybe even if I close my eyes and I just dab in that direction, I'll get even more interesting blends of those colors. I'm literally closing my eyes a bit to, to make them mix a little bit, fight my urge to want to be orderly. Okay. You can see in this painting, it's a little scribbly. Now that's more red than I would want. So I can also come in, I know I'm, I'm going with a lot of options here, but it's really just about going back and forth between these colors, red okay. and white and blue, red and white and blue. And where the red and the white mix, they make purple. Where the red and the white mix, it makes red. Did I say that right? Red and blue mix, it makes purple. <laughs> so there I put in a little bit of blue and if I come back over it and a little bit of white, it just makes a lighter blue. It's a very inexact style of painting. It's very impressionistic. And so it can be a little challenging for those of us who like to be neat and who don't paint loosely ordinarily. And it's a little challenging for me for sure. Okay. It almost looks like knife work. So before I blend all that away into one particular uh, shade, I'm, I'm gonna just give it a rest and, and I'll come back and look at it later. Right now it's looking pretty red and I probably want more pink instead of red. But I'm oh, gonna yeah. step back about 10 feet and then come back and tweak it. But I'm gonna let a little bit of it dry first. Okay. Yeah, mine's looking a little bit like the American flag right now, unintentionally. So the general idea is we want this side to have a little more blue in it than the other side. And the other side's gonna have a little more white in it. And up close, this looks like a big old mess. But if you've ever seen a Van Gogh or a Monet up close, they look like a big old mess. And then when you step back 10 feet, that's when they look beautiful. I hadn't thought of it that way, but I'll have to pay attention next time. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, they're terrible up close. They, um, have you seen a Monet or Van Clo uh, the originals up close? I have seen them, but it's been quite a while. Uh, I've seen a Monet, I've seen Monet this uh, exhibit, but it's been a while, so I, I, I don't remember it like that. Yeah, they, they just look messy up close. Oh. And this looks messy too, but, uh, but the real look is, what's it look like 10 feet away? Yeah. When Monet painted, they were very critical of him because it was a new style, Impressionism was a new style. And so they said, they told him, yours is just an underpainting. I'm barely touching the canvas, by the way, when I'm smearing this. I'm, yeah. I'm holding it like a feather, just super soft. 
Um, but they, you know, his critics said, that's an underpainting. That's not a real painting. You're not finished. And he said, no, no, you don't understand what I'm trying to do here. He said, the, what I'm painting is not the actual um, item or subject. What I'm painting is your memory of what you saw after you close your eyes and look away. I got that. So this side is deliberately supposed to be a little more blue because it's the shady side. I gotcha. And I'm just kind of script scratching with just the tiniest amount of paint and a couple bristles on the end of my tiny brush. Two hairs and some air, as Bob Ross would say. <laughs> Just trying to make it a little more blue so it doesn't quite look so much like the American flag. And I noticed too, this one is more sloped. So I could actually pull it out if I wanted and build it up. You can always make your mountain bigger, but it's real hard to make it smaller. I think I'd probably, I could do the same effect just with my thumb, I think. <laughs> my fingers. But a lot of people, a lot of uh, people will paint like this with a knife. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. And then when I get to this side, I'm gonna make this side a lot brighter. It's gonna have a whole lot more white and pink. Okay. Because this is the the light, the one that's getting hit by the uh, moon, so I just won't need quite as much paint on this side. And where it butts up against the other side of the mountain, I'm I'm going to make that nice and bright pink, so it's really obvious where the slope changes. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And it really makes that ridge just stand up. I feel like I'm combing hair on a caterpillar. <laughs> Very light touch. I am deliberately exaggerating 
the difference between the two sides, just to illustrate a point. But on this, it's much more subtle. I gotcha. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that there's always a shadow side and a light side. So think of this as an exaggeration. If yours isn't so exaggerated, no problem, that's great. But I am exaggerating it to show, show the difference. So okay. when you want a shadow side, you just add blue. I say, sure, dark. I can go in and lighten it up a bit so it's not so obvious. As long as I made the point. I was up really late last night. Well, I don't know if it was even late. I'd call it early. Um, watch, binge watching a really good uh, Netflix series. Have oh. you seen the the King, the Queen's Gambit? I've heard about it. I haven't. I haven't watched it yet. It's about a woman chess player um, oh. and her life. And boy, it's. It's one of those things you kind of go, man, I wish I wouldn't have heard of this because now I want to watch the whole thing. Oh, it's a, it's not a movie. It's, it's a series. It's, um, it's a mini series, I think. I don't know how many episodes I wa watched last night. I fell asleep, but a oh. lot. <laughs> oh, I've done that, yeah. And I'm not quite sure. Maybe there's eight or 10 episodes, something like that. I don't know. Oh, okay, gotcha. I read something about it's supposed to be very well done. Yeah, it's 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 addictive, boy. It was good. Good to know in advance. It's a little disturbing. I mean, she definitely had a disturbing life. Oh, in really? Some ways. Oh. Um, but it's, it's nice to see a woman uh, in a movie that just shows how absolutely brilliant she is. Gotcha. Netflix has some good movies. Pardon me? Netflix does some good movies. Yeah. So obviously I'm just kind of going back and forth with the colors and just kind of enjoying the process of the paint. Um, but you can stop whenever you are happy with what you have. And I have not stepped away. I really should take my own advice and step away. Okay, I should too. I'm kind of at the point where I'm happy. Good. I feel like I'm not really accomplishing anything more. Yeah, I get that. It's uh, this is a strange painting too. Like you know, just the the way the uh, technique is kind of odd. Mm. I'm used to painting Bob Ross uh, mountains, and it's a we use a knife, but it's very different. Oh, uh huh, sure. You can get more um, ruggedness with a yes. A knife yeah this is this is a lot smoother um, and a lot more impressionistic so I'm going to step away and take a look at what I've done and see if I can live with it gotcha okay
I'm pretty happy with my ridge here. Yeah. And the difference between the blue side and the pink side, which I really exaggerated, but it's still really uh, uh, steep. And this one is much more sloped. So, you know, that's, that's where I have to tell myself, you know, I have a different style than that painter. And um, I can be upset with myself and I can tweak it and fix it, or I can live with it. And every artist has to ask themselves those questions. Can I live with it? Am I happy with it? Can I accept it as my own style? Or do I need to honor the original artist that I'm using as an inspiration and, and make it more their style and their composition? But only you can answer that question for yourself. Gotcha. I don't, I don't have the ridge, the definition of a ridge like you do. Yeah, mine is pretty exaggerated. Um, you certainly don't have to have any ridge. It's just, you know, it's just an exaggeration to show you how to do it if you wanted one. I am making this a little more sloped at the bottom um, on mine because I noticed mine was so steep and it just seemed to just stop. So I am, um, I am adding a little bit more slope to mine just by brushing it more in this direction. And then whatever I do to one side, I pretty much have to do to the other. I'm just gonna make it a little more gradual drop. But again, you don't have to do that. You can, you know, ask yourself, how do I want my mountain to look? What, maybe you have a mountain in mind. These kind of remind me of Oregon mountains. Oh. Um, I was looking online to see if this is a particular mountain, but um, yeah, I don't know Oregon mountains, but they tend to, a lot of them tend to have this shape, like maybe they're actually volcanoes. Oh, gotcha. We have a different painting of Mount Fuji, so I know it's not that, but... Uh, <laughs> I think I like the way you did your ridge though. Yeah, so if you want to, you know, put in a ridge, all it is is just where your one side touches the other, just make it more dramatic, uh, more blue on this side and more pink on the other. And it makes it a little more dramatic. Mine is definitely the sun has set over, you know, it's not here anymore. And this one, this, you know, um, it's getting, the moon may be out, but the sun might be out too, because it's getting light all over. I so you. just a different time of day or a different placement of the sun and the moon um, will determine how much shade you have. And like I said, I really exaggerated mine maybe too much. Mm -hmm. I got you. Boy, people only text me when I'm here doing a <laughs> film. A video. Other than that, they just they have no no life. But they like to text me in the evening when I'm here filming some a class. Oh. So I don't know if you can hear those little I think notifications. I think your website says you know you're generally there in the evenings. Can you say that again? Your website says you're generally there in the evenings after five. Ah, okay. Well, it's true. If somebody came to the door and they said, I want to buy a paint kit, I would probably say, um, you know, hold on just a second. And then I'd grab them one and come right back. Um, so that, yeah, that's interesting. Okay. But I think these are my family. <laughs> they know better. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Most of my friends are retired and I have to remind them sometimes, you know, I still work. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, yeah. And I think everyone's just so bored right now. Well, that's a true statement. I stuck a little bit more blue on my pink side just so it's not quite as dramatic, but 
You know, that's the thing is I could fuss with this all day long and would it help? I don't know. Sometimes fussing is not a good thing. I'll show you, I'll show you my right now. I don't know if you can see. So do get up and take a look at yours from 10 feet away though, okay? Yeah, I'm gonna do that, I think, here right now. I took a look at it from the phone and it looks better it, on the phone than it does up close. So far so good? Yeah, I looked at it on the on the on my camera. It looks right. better on the camera than up close. They always do. And that's just it, is that impressionistic paintings are supposed to be viewed from far away. Um, if you put your nose in an impressionistic painting at a museum, the security guard will, you know you'll be in trouble. Uh, they, don't, yeah. they don't want you up close to it. And it's not supposed to be seen from up close. It's supposed to be seen from a distance. Yeah. So the way it looks 10 feet away, that's all we really care about here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop fussing with mine. Do you wanna move on to the moon or do you want me to give you more time? No, I, I think I'm done with the mountain. Okay. I think I'm like, here, here's my, if you could, can you see mine? I'm going to turn the volume up again. Sorry. I can't hear you as well. Can you, here's, can you the, here's mine. Okay. Wow. That is beautiful. <laughs> It looks better. It looks better on camera. It's beautiful. They always do. Beautiful. Very nice. All right. So um, now we're just going to clean our brushes really well in our water. Just make sure they're really clean. Just notice I have this gap down here. All right. So I'm gonna use a small brush, but not a teeny tiny one. Uh, this is my second smallest one. And okay. the size you use is up to you. I'm gonna, we're gonna make the moon. Okay. And so I'm putting white paint on the moon, on my brush. And yeah, you know, my white paint isn't entirely white anymore, but that doesn't matter. Off-white works too. And I'm gonna put my brush in the center of where I want my moon to be. And then I'm gonna really slowly circle out. Just really slowly circle out. And if I go slow enough and careful enough, I can make a pretty darn good circle just by going very slowly circling out. If I were to just try to draw a circle freehand, I couldn't do it. Oh, the circle, that... Circles are hard. But if you start in the center and then just circle out, one of two things will happen. Either you will have a really nice circle or you'll get dizzy. Eh. Or both, maybe both. If that is too hard, you could always cheat and use a template. If you have a glass at home or a jelly jar lid or something, you could always cheat. That's okay. up to you. So if how you cheat- it, How big should it get? Well, that depends on your lid. And if you're just circling, 
how much yeah. you want to circle out. And the thing is, I'm not going to make it perfectly white inside. I'm going to, I'm going to leave it less than perfect. Okay. Because I'm going to go in and put some shadows and highlights on that too. Uh -huh. And a nice trick is if it's not perfectly circular, you can always come back in with, uh, you know, make some light blue, the color of your sky, and then, yeah. or medium blue, and then trim it with the sky color. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. And that, no one will ever know you did that either. Well, that technique of just circling with the um, brush, that, Mine came out fairly good for a round. Good. And you know what? Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but the moon is only perfectly round one night a, a month. Oh, yeah. And you wouldn't really want it that perfect. Right. Yep. And even when it's perfectly round, I don't think it's perfectly round in the sky, is it? Because there's like dust storms and stuff. Yeah. So one thing, after I get my white on there, I'm not even gonna wait till it dries. And I'm just gonna scribble on, literally just scribble on some blue. If you didn't put your white on perfectly, you're ahead of the game. But I'll just kind of tap some blue back in there. And I'm gonna favor this side with the blue because this side is a little darker. Oh, gotcha. And then I'm gonna favor the other side with the pink. <coughs> oh, gotcha, okay. And just kind of scribble it in <coughs> here and there. Did you see those astronauts that went off into space? Recently? Yeah, I think it was today or yet yesterday. Oh no, I didn't know about that. Yeah, they that's that guy with Tesla, you know. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They he launched this he launched a rocket. Well, the only reason I bring it up is because the astronauts spacesuits now. Yeah. Remember how they were very uh, puffy looking before? Yeah. Very, they've modernized them. Huh. They look like something of, um, a European policeman would wear. The helmets and everything are all different. Wow. It's kind of, it's very um, modern looking. I, I can't, it looks good. It, it doesn't look bad. It looks good. But just for decades, you've seen those other version. Right. Is yeah. it kind of Star Trek looking? Yeah. More, I would, yeah, more like that. Huh. I'm going to have to go home and look that up. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it was, they looked very good coming out. They didn't look so uncomfortable. You know how the old ones, they look kind of like they couldn't walk. Wow, okay. You know, because they're so puffed up and stiff. Right. And uh, this is not like that. Anyways, when you were saying that, it made me think of the, the men going to the moon and how, um, how they look now. Oh. Face suits. There's no um, perfect way to do the moon. I just scribbled on some blue, scribbled on some pink. And you can even scribble on a little bit of purple or white, as long as it's pocky looking. 
Um, and scribbly and not even, that's all that matters. Okay. And if you wanted, you could even do it with your finger instead. And okay. that creates little craters. Oh, gotcha, okay. We're gonna leave our, after this, we're gonna leave our little brush in the water and let it have a soak in the hot tub. Yeah. Okay. When you're ready with your moon, we're gonna uh, just pick up with our medium brush, a medium brush, I'm using a medium flat brush any medium brush will do. I'm going to go in and I'm going to, down below our mountain, I'm going to paint it black. Oh, okay. Which looks really harsh after we've been looking at all these pastels. Gotcha, yeah. But, uh, but it, is, it is the correct thing to do at this point for this okay. painting. And if you want to leave a little bit of that blue above the black, you can. It just depends on, you know, on what you want. Or you can put it right up to the base of the mountain, whatever you think looks best. Okay. If your mountains end kind of foggy and soft, then maybe you wanna, you know, let that be above the black. But mine don't, mine kind of just stops. So I, I'm only too happy to put the black close. Okay. Excuse me. What? Thanks. I have the fan going and it's stirring up the dust. Oh. Yeah. So I just put the black and then I did slope it up a little bit on the sides just because I want the focus to be on my mountain and that, you know, makes it darker on the sides and helps direct your eye. Uh, our oh. trees are going to be coming out of the side parts. Okay. As well. And then I'm going to pick up the, bo the bottom of my painting as well and paint that black too. Being very careful not to put my hand in my mountain or my moon. I'm just looking in the camera, noticing how much more contrast there is in that one. I really should just step away, but I'm like, oh, I'll just put in a few little contrasting lines. Yeah. That, that tweaking can get you in a lot of trouble sometimes. Yeah. I'm still doing the black. Yeah, no problem. I'm just hanging out. Waiting for you. No worries. I'm almost done with the blind. No worries. We have plenty of time. You see me slapping my own hand. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay, my black is done. <laughs> okay. It's black. Wow. All right. I smooth that out. I scratched it all up. Okay. So black is done. Good. So now what we have to do is we have to create these grasses underneath our pine trees. So I'm going to try it this way and see if it works. 
I didn't clean my medium brush after I used it. And I'm going to just try to bend my bristles and flick up. Yep, that worked okay. I'm going to press down, flick up, press down, flick up, press down, flick up. And I want those grasses to be different heights. Press down, flick up. And some of them are going to be at a different slant because this is, you know, theoretically in the foothills or the mountains. Um, so we want those grasses to be, to not look like they're mowed in a park. So a flicking motion gives us the more erratic um, shapes and clumps and heights than if I were to just stroke it on. Are you picking up more paint when you do it? You know what? I have only picked up the paint once. I put a drop of water on my brush. You can oh, actually, you can steal the paint from down here. You don't oh. even have to use any paint. See how I'm just stealing it from down here? I see, okay. I'm just flicking it up because the paint, I have so much paint down here drying that if I just, it's almost like I'm just pulling it up and flicking. Okay, gotcha. It feels like I'm putting on mascara. <laughs> And I want to be careful. I don't want it to, I, I don't want to try to make it all the same height because I really don't want it to look like anyone mowed in the last century. Okay. Or ever. And you can slant the grasses, you know, toward the center a bit or, you know, maybe in opposite directions in a clump, just so uh, it doesn't look, everything doesn't look too straight. Okay. I don't believe your brush kit, your uh, brush kit has a fan brush. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Which is just fine. There's more than one way to paint the trees and things. I'll show you two different ways or well, two different brushes. I'm going to be using a medium flat brush when I do my trees. Okay. But you can actually use any size flat brush. You ready for the trees? Well, I'm ready. Okay, so I'm going to take my flat brush and I'm going to pull it down and pull my black paint down and I'm going to load it on both sides, but I'm going to chisel it by flipping it over on the side of my plate or palette, whatever you have there. And because I'm chiseling it because I want to make that edge as flat as I can make it. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then I'm going to, I'm going to put my big tree over here. So here's another bravery test. I'm going to pop down 
a trunk, but I'm not just dragging it down in one fell swoop because I don't want the trunk to be even or straight. Okay. I want to have a little character to it. Okay. And then I'm gonna reload and re-chisel my flat brush and I'll chisel my flat brush as many times as it needs. If, if your flat brush doesn't make a thin point, a thin edge, then see if you, another flat brush will. I could use my large flat brush for this too, as long as it's flat. And then I'm gonna drop down, make sure that's nice and pointy at the top. I'm gonna drop down about a half an inch and then I'm gonna tap with just the flat part of the brush. And I'm gonna tap kind of bouncing. It's like I'm in a bouncy castle. And I'm bouncy, 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 bouncy on the side. And I'm not putting any pressure whatsoever. It's just the lightest. It's almost like you have a two-year-old in a bouncy castle. They're just light. Just the feet are light. And it's just the lightest touch. No pressure. No bristles are bending on this brush. It's just tap, tap in the slightest, lightest pressure I can. And I want to make sure that the tree starts to go out to be more triangular as I go down. So it's got to be wider. They were very tiny at the top and they're getting wider. And every so often I reload and re-chisel. But what I want to make sure is that I can still see some sky between my branches. I want there to be room for the birds to come and make a nest. Okay. But I also want them to be close enough that it doesn't look like a ladder. And maybe there's four branches in that space on that side, but maybe there's only two on this side. I don't want anything to look too perfect. And I'm just tapping, tapping, tapping to get that shape. And you know, in a real tree, maybe a bird or a kid or a bear climbed it. Well, I guess a bird wouldn't climb it, but um, bird nests are in it and kids climb trees and bears climb trees. Um, and, and so, you know, there might be some broken branches in there. There might be a gap. Um, there might be some that are close together and some that are farther apart. It's, we don't want anything to be too perfect. Okay. Or again, then it looks like Disney World, you know, um, which is great, fun, but a little too fake. So any place that looks a little sparse, you can just tap over the center a bit, and that's tapping on those branches that are sticking out toward us. Okay. It's kind of like if you build a Christmas, an artificial Christmas tree, if you've ever done that. Uh -huh. You don't yeah. want the you don't want the trunk to show because that oh. looks fake, right? So I'm tapping over the trunk a bit as I go to okay. hide that trunk and to add more fullness in the center area. Okay. And I'm gonna take these branches all the way down. And the reason I'm taking them all the way down is if you see a, tr a pine tree with the trunk sticking out like that, that means someone has mowed underneath, that they've trimmed the branches underneath to mow, or maybe trim the branches to cut down the tree. Christmas trees look like that. And trees in parks and on lawns look like that. Um, because they've been mowed, the branches have been removed. But if you go up into the mountains, you'll notice that the branches, the grass grows right up to the bottom branches. And you yeah. don't see those posts like you would on a Christmas tree. If your, if your branches look a little like a bottle brush, like really sparse, it could mean that you're not using enough paint. But if it looks like you can't see the sky behind it and it's just a solid black cone, then you're probably using too much paint. Okay. So it's kind of a fine line there. You wanna be able to see the, the sky between the branches Maybe that's a little nest on the end. I don't know, I've got a clump there, but I'm gonna resist the urge to fix it because trees should be imperfect. 
But do you see how you can still see the sky and the mountain behind it a little bit? Yeah, I but can. But then in the center where the trunk is, I can go back and forth over this trunk area to hide the trunk and add a little fullness, fullness in this center area, just like I would if I were building a artificial Christmas tree. My mom has a tree like that. Out oh, here, yeah, okay. Yep. You just have to resituate them. One one time for when my kids were in school, um, we had for their baseball team, we had a a fundraiser and we sold little miniature Christmas trees as a fundraiser. And so we put together a million of them. And I just remember hour after hour fluffing those center branches. <laughs> um, wow. So this painting only has the tree on one side, the big tree. Mm -hmm. But then wow. it has these two little ones on the other side, on the far side. Okay. I'm going to go to the computer and take a look at your tree and let me know. Um, let me know if you need any tips on it. In order to do that, I have to turn the volume down on this side so I don't have to Ooh la la, beautiful tree. Okay. Nailed it the first time. Okay, good deal. So we're going to paint two more trees now on this side. It's the same technique. Because they're smaller, we're going to have to either be much more careful or use a smaller flat brush. I don't have a smaller flat brush handy, so I'm going to be much more careful. Okay. And I am really removing any clumps that I have on that big my my fan brush, my medium brush. Okay. I, I was gonna tell you, um, I was gonna show you with another size brush, but when I, I forgot when I was over here, but you can also do it with a large brush on a large tree, a large flat brush. I just didn't show you that, but you can use your imagination on that one. On this side, uh, the tree is there's a medium sized tree over here. So I wanna make it shorter than the one over there. And so I'm tapping my trunk on so it's not perfect, it's not straight. Don't want anything straight and perfect. I'm dropping down about a half an inch. And then those top branches, very delicately, very soft, very tiny and fragile and sweet. And then as I go down, they're getting bigger and thicker and a little more pressure as I go down because those are older branches and they're a little more hardy. And I'm going to remember to make it triangular. If it's a really tall, skinny, you know, pine, it could be a lodgepole pine. They have those in California a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, old forests. In Colorado, we have a lot of blue spruces. They're they're um, they're rounder and they're they seem hardier, like thicker, uh, yeah. and they're definitely wider. So it just depends on the kind of pine tree you're used to seeing. And and more paint on my brush as I go down. I start white. 
to get the shape. Yeah. And then I kind of go back. And fill in the, the fullness. Yeah, to get more, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm doing too. That way, it, it, uh, if I make a mistake, it's not a big mess. Yeah. yeah it doesn't really matter the order. Just do what feels right to you. I, I actually usually do that too. But I don't know if I have, actually, I don't know if I have a usually. Just depends on my mood. <laughs> And sometimes I make a mess and then I paint over it. I wow. hear you. So then the baby is just the same way, just a lot more slow and careful and delicate. And maybe the baby's leaning a little bit, you know, a little bit in the other direction. I just want to avoid anything too perfect. Gotcha. And this painting has three trees, you know, but if you really love painting trees and it's more process, not product for you, you know, put however many trees you want. It's, it's your painting, your world. Okay. It's your national park that you just wandered into. Yep. I like doing pine trees with fan brushes. That's uh, something we teach here a lot at the studio. Um, but you know, those aren't basic. They don't. Yeah, kind of I I've done pine trees with a fan brush. It's a little bit, it's a little easier, faster, I should say, not easier, but faster. Yeah. Yeah, I think fan brushes are definitely easier. But it's good to know how to do different, use different brushes for different things. It's it's challenging yeah. for me to, 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 you know, go out of my comfort. If I'm used to always using a fan brush, it's kind of nice to do something, you know. There's some yeah. teachings here at the studio that they, boy, they just swore by the medium brush is the best way to do a pine tree. And, you know, I always felt, well, the fan brush is better, but they're just mm. different. Yeah. Interesting. I think the key is, you know, make sure your branches go all the way down to the bottom so you don't have a post. That's really important. Yeah, I agree. And that your trunk is not real obvious. Um, a lot of beginners will just make their trunks really sparse. And yeah. I think, you know, they, they picture the branches coming out this way and the branches coming out that way, but then they forget there's branches growing to the back of the tree, straight back, and there's branches growing straight front to the front as well. Yeah. And that's where this tapping for the fullness, that creates those branches. It, are sticking straight out at us. Yeah. So this is for our painting. We are done. If you wanted to put any more, um, you know, detail in it, if you want to paint a little deer or a howl howling wolf or whatever, it's really up to you. That might be a different day's project. Um, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I, I I hear you on that, yeah. You know, or you could put in, a couple, I, couple more trees. What's that? I um, It came out pretty good, yeah. I like nice. it. Nice, yay. I really like to put little birds um, in my sky because I like to have something show up as natural. 
and they could be in the moon, they could be in front of the mountain. Um, you don't have to do little birds, but if you wanted to, there's a really easy way, just make a dot and then a handwriting V. Oh. Um, and you can get some little, I guess they're more like seagulls, but you know, who knows? This could be Oregon. It, they might have, they have seagulls there, right? Well, it could be, a, that could be an eagle. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm going with an eagle. That's what it is. <laughs> A, an eagle in the distance. I just like to put a little bit of nature in there in mine, but um, you know, do whatever you want. It, you could leave it just the way it is. It's beautiful just the way it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's nice. I like that with the bird, uh, two birds right there. Usually I put them in the sky. But for some reason, this area looked a little bare. Yeah. I'm half tempted to put a couple little baby trees there. Um, uh, but the birds, you know, I still might. I'll be honest with you. I still might. Before I throw it on the sale table, I might stick a couple baby pine trees here. Um, I hear you. I might do that too, I think. But when you're finished, you can take any brush, any color you want and your tiniest brush and just sign your name. Um, and then that way, someday when I see your painting in the Louvre, I'll know <laughs> that it was you. <laughs> that is hilarious. <laughs> or maybe the Denver Institute of Art. And I'll <laughs> recognize, hey, I know that painting. Oh, that is hilarious. I you might see it. It. you I might see it at the garage sale, but maybe <laughs> <laughs> I have seen um they have this website. I do a lot of well I, during when it's not pandemic time, I teach a lot of Bob Ross classes. We're not doing that now because they're six hours long. Um, but they have this website that is hilarious. I can't remember what the address is, but it's basically they went to garage sales and found Bob Ross paint style paintings. You know, oh. I mean by amateurs, people, you know, not his paintings, but just amateur Bob Ross paint style paintings. And then yeah. they painted monsters into them. Oh. And so there's like Godzilla and, you know, Loch Ness monsters. And they are so funny. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, wow. Uh, oh, man, that's the, the Loch Ness monsters. Oh, my gosh. It's a pretty silly idea, and, and hopefully the people who painted the originals never see it and get offended, but, oh, man, it's funny. <laughs> are Bob Ross paintings, you know, the ones that he, are they, do you, are those, uh, like, of value now that he's gone? Yes. Oh. They absolutely are. There was a story about this guy who... Um, he was living in Alaska. This guy was living in Alaska when Bob was in Alaska. Um, and he bought an, a, an original early Bob Ross painting when Bob was just learning how to paint. And then he brought it home and his wife hated the painting. And she made, it, she made him take it out to the barn. And so he hung it in the barn. And um, he said, she said it was just kind of dark and creepy. She didn't like it. So years later, the kids were uh, packing up mom and dad's stuff and they found an original Bob Ross and, and the young man said to his dad, um, where'd you get this painting, dad? And he said, oh, some hippie in Alaska sold it to me. Um, isn't it terrible? And <laughs> his son said, it looks like an original Bob Ross. <laughs> oh. And sure enough, Sure enough, and his wife was like, oh, that hideous thing that, you know, that's not anything. And they had it appraised. It was an original Bob Ross, and it was one of his early ones, and it, they sold it for $16,000. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that was uh, last year or the year before. Huh, wow. 
Well, I didn't realize he lived up in Alaska. Yeah, he, um, no so wonder he was born and raised in Daytona Beach. And then he uh, joined the army and he was a drill sergeant in the army and he had never seen snow before oh. or ice. He had never, never seen any winter or anything. And so they stationed him in uh, Alaska and he got off the plane, he fell on his tush uh, on the ice and that was his first exposure to snow and cold and ice and he just fell in love with Alaska. So oh, he what? lived up there in the military and he, um, after he retired, I don't know if it was after he retired or when he was just not on duty, I don't really know. He worked in a bar up there and he would paint just because the days were long and there was nothing else to do. And so he used to watch Bill Alexander paint on PBS. Oh, and God. Bill, um, I don't know if you ever saw Bill Alexander. He had a show a lot like Bob's. And he's uh, this old German guy, more gruff. His personality was seemed more gruff, but his the things he said were very sweet. Mm -hmm. And he would say, I love you, I love you, thank you for painting. And, um, really interesting. You can still find his videos on YouTube, Bill Alexander. And he, so Bob learned to paint watching Bill Alexander. And some oh. of the things that Bill said, Bob said in his show too. Oh, is that like, right? Happy trees and happy clouds, happy little trees and clouds. Um, Bob's, Bill said those first. And so, so Bob learned to paint watching Bill. And then at some point, then he became, um, he went to study with Bill and work with Bill um, when Bill was on TV. And then at some point, um, the, this is a story I heard that Bob was teaching Bill's techniques in strings um, and in classes. And he had to learn to paint really fast because people would walk by in the strip malls and he'd want to keep their attention or in the, the sh big shopping malls and he'd want to keep their attention. So he would paint really fast and, um, and people would stop and watch this guy painting so fast. So he was going from this, he was going from one place to another. This is the story I heard. And he drove past a PBS station, I think in Indiana, and he, he went in, he, he wanted to sell them a painting. And they said, well, let's see a paint. And um, he said, well, I paint like Bill Alexander and here you go. And he painted fast. And they said, you know, we have this room on our calendar um, with no show in it. Can you show up and, and teach a little class to our local audience? Oh. And that was it. Oh. They fell in love with him and then he, you know. And that was the beginning. Him. Yeah. Wow. Interesting. I didn't know. I didn't know the background. Yeah. I can't believe he was a drill sergeant. Yeah, I can't either. I can't imagine, you know, his personality screaming at men, you know. Yeah. Do you it hear me? It kind of makes sense to have to go home and relax and painting is a good way to relax. Yeah. Huh. I, yeah. I have a husband and three sons. I can imagine going home after and screaming at, like after screaming at men wanting to paint. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that's funny. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna sign my name with, I think I'm gonna use red paint. And then I'm done. I added some trees to mine just for fun, because. I did I did the same. I put in a couple as well. Nice. And I put the birds in too. Oh, fun. Yay. Mine, are, mine don't look as good, but I put them in, what the heck. What the heck, right? Yeah. Mine don't look that great up close. It's just from a distance, they look okay. Passable. <laughs> That's true. Well, thank you for painting with me today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.